Right on. So the recording is on. Uh, thanks everyone else um, for joining here. Another lovely Sunday, I guess. Uh, so far, we have our uh, pre-markets um, and and futures and whatnot open in here in a few hours. So kind of a timely timely little session. I think we've had a couple of these now after a absolutely brutal Friday and a very rough week uh, to begin with. I think there's lots of narratives happening. There's lots of talk, uh, lots of discussion, uh, strange rumors being being thrown around that can't be verified either way, which is again, strange, uh, especially for a country as big as China. Uh, lots, lots definitely happening out there uh, along with just a general, I guess, unknown, unknownness in the market um many many people are sort of on the fence as to what to do i've had a couple of close buddies actually who are saying they're done with the market uh, they kind of entered the stock markets in 2020 when people had lots of time people had extra money i guess possibly sitting around and um, i think the story for a lot of people uh, a lot of retail uh, participants anyway, who had joined uh, the market in 2020 and everything was easy. Everything was, uh, oh, this is a easy thing. I never have to work again in my life. I, I can just make a hundred percent gains every year and uh, live off of that. And I think the bubble, if you will, is sort of deflating on that where I think people are realizing why why the stock markets are are what they are. And you know, for those of us, I, I mean, I've only been in the market since 2013. There was many, many months and, and even years of just either nothing happening in the market or just complete apathy, uh, especially towards oil and gas. I think we're, we're used to oil, the, the oil and energy sector being more affected in these market drawdowns than maybe the rest of the market. Um, this year obviously has been sort of the opposite of that. Uh, but in a general broad market sell-off, it seems like energy is, is once again taking it on the chin uh, much, much, much worse. Uh, as far as kind of where things are um, from a supply demand perspective, sort of what I focus on, I don't see any effect really of this uh, dollar index strengthening. Uh, I don't see any uh, impact so far of the federal funds rate going up from a oil supply demand strictly perspective. Uh, we are, we're probably in a better position than we were in maybe even two weeks ago uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, lower pricing always brings on higher demand, uh, no matter what, what commodity is. Uh, in a lot of cases, well, in 99% in of cases, lower pricing will bring in higher demand. Um, compared to previous cycles, a lot of the demand recently has been from the emerging markets, uh, not, not from America itself. So if we're looking at just America, just the developed world market perspective, we're missing out on a lot of the, the demand that's actually out there. I saw numbers from India just came in uh, this morning for, for their crude imports. The consumption numbers I don't think are in yet, uh, but uh, definitely, the emerging markets are a much bigger play on it. Uh, secondly, China has reopened in a, in a material way. Uh, we look at flights, we're tracking flights, Shanghai, Beijing uh, are kind of coming back to where they were after they had already reopened. Uh, we see the two areas that were shut down here uh, in early September, uh, Chengdu and Shenzhen, big hubs for not only travel, but also just manufacturing and economic activity are picking up quite substantially. Um, and, and I've always said that flight data and, and the number of flights ongoing is sort of a proxy for how the economy is doing in, in those particular areas. So um, that going forward is obviously going to be a big, big, big factor uh, for oil demand. We also see China has put out extra product uh, export quotas, which Hopefully, will mean that the refiners are going to run harder. 
which is going to draw crude and put out products products being in short supply here uh, maybe not maybe not the gasoline market in asia but the middle distillates uh, kind of across the world and then even the gasoline market within the us has sort of gotten very skewed where there's certain areas uh, you're you're getting six dollar gallon gasoline certain areas are are much much lower and not just because of taxes but the actual cracks for gasoline have gone just completely out of whack um, in certain areas the other thing is russian exports uh, we look at the latest vortex of data that i'm tracking um, august was roughly 140 million barrels of seaborne exports including the cpc blend out of uh, novo Rusisk. so that includes kazakh crude um, 24 days into September, we're only at about 100 million barrels uh, so far this month in September. So about 450,000 barrels a day lower uh, month over month. I don't see this really in the market yet. I, I haven't seen any major news reports of this. I think they're just waiting until September ends and we get some actual full data uh, of that. I also need to track the product exports, which may be a little bit higher, but I, I just don't see them being uh, that much higher out of Russia. Um, so saying all that, I think the market has just said, it doesn't matter. The market said, we, we don't really care about any of this. Uh, we, we care about the impending recession. We care about the uh, funds rate and we care about the dollar index getting stronger. And that's what the market is telling us. It has absolutely cratered crude. It has affected the equities. Uh, the general broad market is getting hammered. And um, there's, there's very little line of sight as to what's coming. Um, it, it's, a, it's a complete battle right now between the general economy and the funds rate and the stronger dollar versus can China ramp up fast enough? Do the US SPR barrels drop off? Uh, does Russian barrels drop off? Um, narrative that's exactly what it is because on a supply a strictly oil supply demand perspective nothing has changed uh, i would almost argue like i said that we're in a more bullish case now or i shouldn't say more bullish case we are we are in a more undersupplied environment uh, than we were even two weeks ago when the price of oil was 10 to 12 dollars above where we are um, so the general economy, I think the, the Fed is hell-bent on bringing inflation down. Uh, I'm not gonna sit here and claim to be a, a macro expert on the, on the broad economy and sort of what's happening. Uh, however, um, <laughs> we're, we're definitely fighting the Fed. The oil and gas market has to fight the Fed here because the federal, funds rate, what they're doing is they're saying, look, we need to bring inflation down for that. We need to slow down of the economy. We need to bring the price of oil down and gas down. That is basically why inflation is so high, the price of energy across the world. And so far, it seems like they've accomplished what they're doing, um, but it's just leading to greater and greater problems. I've already heard that some of the new drilling plants have been shuffled back. Some of the workovers have been shuffled back, uh, the water flood expansions, et cetera. So when we look at the other side of this, where, where do we end up on the other side of this? Uh, from an oil supply demand perspective, it's just getting worse and worse. This, the situation going into 2023, um, even if the economy goes into a massive recession, uh, we see Europe slowing down, we see whatever you want to say. If we end up in a place where we're two to three to four million barrels a day undersupplied in the next few months, it just is not going to matter how how much you can slow the economy down and right now there's there's really nothing i can say uh to to help the uh us oil investors who have who have taken it uh taken this loss over the last couple of weeks um i think the the main point has always been that the the undersupply is coming they've band-aided it with the spr they've band-aided it with the recession uh narratives they banded it with the um russian barrels are still on the market the chinese lockdowns it's all blurred the market to a point where you know we think that there's a slowdown actually occurring when in reality um 
you know, you, you can look at oil storage anywhere, US, China, Europe, uh, Fujara, Singapore, floating storage. We're still drawing inventories, both crude and products, and demand is rising. We look at flights, we look at travel in India, we look at even American demand data, which has been uh, misleading, you can say, we're still drawing inventories in America with people saying the demand is below 2020 levels. Um, we're never gonna go get back to 2019 levels, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens when we do? And that's basically my thesis. I haven't sold anything. I did get uh, margin called Friday. So there will be something exiting the portfolio here uh, Monday. Uh, unless there's some sort of massive rebound in prices here when, when futures open. Um, and uh, that's that. I know it's not very uh, reassuring. Uh, my, my thinking about this is that as long as I can, I or we can sustain this, get through this blip uh, that's upon us here, um, whatever's coming on the other side is just getting more and more and more attractive. Uh, to a point where, I mean, this was the year, 2022 was the year where governments could have said, look, uh, oil producers, uh, natural gas producers will support you. Let's get supply online. It's a, it's a national crisis. It's a worldwide crisis. Let's get supply online uh, as fast as possible. We'll, we'll support these initiatives. Uh, yet they went completely the other way. They started drawing inventories. Uh, out of the SPR, which further reduces the supply investment. Uh, uh, it, it reduces the price of oil to get to that high oil prices, cure high oil prices scenario, uh, which is literally the only way you're gonna solve this issue. Uh, because if you don't solve it, whatever's coming on the other side is just high inflation. Uh, if the price of energy just keeps going up on the other side, well, you're gonna have high inflation. You can't have energy prices go up 30, 20, 30, 40% every year, and then low inflation. It just, it just does not match. Um, and a lot of political pressure right now, uh, both from China and within America. And I guess we'll see, we'll see what ends up winning, but, but the, the structural bullish outlook, in my opinion, nothing has changed. Uh, from an equity perspective, things have changed and uh, possibly a good time to, to kind of re, reevaluate what's going on. I myself am looking at, at companies. There was a Twitter post I got put out saying, if the companies you want to buy more of are down 10% and the companies in your portfolio, you, you maybe no longer believe in that much are down 10%, it may be time for a reshuffle. Uh, that being said, I don't really see any obvious opportunities within, within my portfolio, but definitely keeping an eye out. I've, I've said this before. I'm looking at some of the junior companies a little bit more. Uh, and and if if one or two of those sort of gets gets hammered where a, a big holder is being liquidated or somebody gets margin called and they got to sell, uh, there could potentially be a chance where I, I maybe move one of my larger uh, mid a small to mid cap holdings into a, a junior name. Um, again, the the thinking from my end is that whatever's coming on the other side of this is just going to it's just getting better and better. It's getting, it's getting to a higher price environment and a higher stable price environment. Um, and I'm gonna set myself up to, to kind of really take in uh, as much torque out of that as possible. So uh, that's my little spiel. I do have a macro outlook session coming up uh, October 30th, I believe. That'll be the three month uh, session. We had one on April 30th, uh, July 30th, and then October 30th. Uh, I'll share all the latest charts on the inventories and uh, supply, demand, et cetera. Uh, we'll have sort of a clear picture as well about the gas to oil switching uh, in, in Europe by then and the Chinese economy and the Russian barrels, kind of the, the, the three things that are going to take control of this market um, going forward here. So um, yeah, so that's that uh, today. Uh, before I begin, a few things. Um, we're going to go on with our evaluation sessions here. Um, I did move this session from October 2nd to today and then move the junior 
uh, company session to October 2nd. I just didn't get a chance to talk to a couple of the CEOs that I wanted uh, of those companies. So um, set up my meetings this week and then discuss it with them and kind of go on uh, um, with those sessions next week. Uh, so today we got Headwater, uh, Rubelite, and Kiwatna, uh, Kiwitino, you know, uh, two clear water producers that just started up after obviously Baytex really showed the world what the Peavine clear water can do. So Headwater was sort of a, a an early entrant, Rubelite maybe a little bit later on. One has done a lot better than the other in various ways. Uh, which is also reflected in the stock price. And then we got Kiwetno, which is uh, a Pat Carlson company, the founder of Seven Gens, who has uh, come back with this uh, iteration, kind of targeting the Duvernay oil along with a ESG spin on it, which uh, I'll discuss. And very, very heavily marketed company through RBC, uh, especially because Arc Financial is back in the game with uh, Maybe not a pure play ENP, but sort of a, a different a different spin on it. So uh, yeah, so we'll get started on these. Before I begin, a couple of things. I'm not an investment advisor. Everything I share is my opinion uh, based on this, this uh, eight times free cash flow model and my insights from my time of working in the industry, talking with management, discussing with other, other industry participants and people working in the industry. Uh, so please do your own due diligence on these companies that I will discuss today. Uh, please check your risk tolerance. I stress it every session and the market gives me a reason to stress it more every week. So the risk tolerance is exceptionally important. There's a chart that goes around saying that if you take a 30% drawdown on your portfolio, you now need your equities to go up 45% to break even. Um, that's the same math you can use for equities that are already up. So if your portfolio is already up 100% this year and you take a 30% drawdown, you now still need a 45% up uh, to, to get back to where you were, assuming that's your investment kind of criteria. And uh, please check your own portfolio construction as well. I, I did mention here earlier that I got the margin call here Friday. So my portfolio is set up for, for about a 50% margin position. Uh, no, about a 30% margin position. So 50% margin on my, on my equities. And uh, it's set up for that sort, of, that sort of portfolio construction. It's also set up for a higher oil price environment going forward. So I'm willing to take on a little bit of downside risk uh, with the junior plays and the option plays, but um, so please check your portfolio construction, the way you're gonna set it up. Uh, there's very, very few of us here, a very select group, I guess, who choose to invest 90% plus of our portfolios in oil and gas equities, which itself brings on a, a uh, different sort of portfolio construction risk than maybe some of the other uh, sorts of portfolio constructions. Um, I also have a mailing list going out. So it, the files for these valuations, the Q2 results, the corporate presentations, the Zoom links, I do send those out about a day or two before the sessions. If you wanna get on the list, please shoot me a DM or an email and I'll get you on there. It is being manually done. So there are certain emails that are on the mailing list. If you're listening in and you aren't getting them, it's because your, your email provider is blocking uh, files above a certain size. And I get about five or 10 emails that, get, that bounce back because the files are just too big. Um, not sure what I can do about that. It's, it's just that some of these corporate presentations have so many pictures and graphs and other stuff in it that, that the files are just big. Uh, so uh, that's that. And the both the Zoom and the Twitter space are recorded. The Zoom will be on my YouTube. The Twitter space will be on Twitter, obviously, and will be saved there. And um, for anyone listening in on the Twitter space, and you would like to join for the Zoom part of the session, uh, whitetundra.ca 
scroll to the bottom under events. There is a Zoom link there for today's session and you can uh, follow along here. Um, if not, if you're driving or you just want to listen in, the Twitter space will continue on. Uh, so I'll do that. Uh, we'll, we'll go through the three companies and then maybe we'll do a Q&A session if there's anything else uh, regarding any, any data you would like to know about. Uh, I, I have been really spending a lot of time in Vortexa in uh, Rystad, tracking some crude flows and movements and sort of ships. Uh, what do you call that? When they, they book ships for October, November, December, that sort of thing. Uh, so tracking a lot of that sort of stuff and uh, along with uh, some of the company specific information. There's a lot of new drills coming out, uh, which is really, really cool because there's some new technologies being put out there. There's some new water flooding slash polymer slash CO2 uh, wells out there. There's some longer wells being drilled. Uh, and there's also some wells that are more spaced out being drilled, which is a complete reversal from kind of 2016 onwards where companies were just jamming as many wells as they could closer and closer, drilling longer laterals and more prop end. It was like more is better uh, until they realized, well, hang on a sec, we're spending a lot of money on this and we're not really get, getting it back. So uh, there's sort of been a shift in the industry. There was a big conference here uh, a couple of weeks ago in Toronto. A few interesting insights came out of that. So um, definitely, uh, it's just been an interesting time. We're, we're, we're at a time when just about everybody who's looked at oil companies or energy companies can say, okay, we're in an energy crisis. Like we need more supply. We need to drill more. Demand just doesn't seem to be going down um, despite renewables and electric and all this. So we need more, uh, more supply coming online. We see the producers themselves believe this story uh, after a long, long time because they aren't hedging. When the prices were higher, they refused to hedge, given that they knew sort of, okay, this is sort of what's coming up. And yet the price of oil and the equities uh, and even the price of other energy sources just keeps getting clobbered uh, because of short-term dislocations in the market. And uh, that is what it is. We, you know, we don't, we don't uh, make the rules of the market. They make the rules, we play the game. And you know, maybe it's a good time to, to remind ourselves of this. Uh, not saying there's anything going on, but uh, the rules are the rules. We just play the game and uh, try to make the best money uh, that we can out of that. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll move my macro outlook a little bit earlier, maybe October 16th or some, just, just to, uh, give an earlier update on sort of some of the inventory and demand data I've been seeing, but um, maybe I'll leave that for now. So, so anyway, the first company we're gonna get started with is Headwater uh, run by Neil Rozelle, one of the most highly regarded uh, management teams in the industry, uh, a management team that basically if they're starting a company or they're going into a play, you just throw money at it. You just say, look, take my money, do whatever with it as you want. And I know I'm gonna probably do well with this going forward. We see that because the, the two big boys, I guess, in the industry, uh, Rafi and Eric have both left their money in Headwater for probably much longer than their usual investment uh, holding period. And despite this company trading at an absolutely crazy premium, they, they seem to have sustained that premium and there's no large holders really selling out except uh, Synovus, which I'll talk about here uh, later on, and pretty strong buying support with this with this name. I've always been sort of confused as to what the what the theory is here, but um, when people believe that the management teams are going to make the money, they maybe are just more confident with these names and uh, leaving their cash in there. So, so Q2 results. Uh, about a 12,000 BOEs per day, 11,772, 11, 90 plus percent liquids, mostly clear water production. They do have a gas field out east, but I don't think that was producing in Q2. Uh, so heavy oil, 
about 10,600 barrels heavy oil. Uh, we got about 230 million shares out there, 546 a share. So 1.25 billion market cap, debt-free. They got 130 million of cash on the books. So it gives us an enterprise value of $1.1 billion. And something that's interesting is I see more and more companies now as I do these sessions are going into this completely debt-free status. Uh, maybe one out of every five or six companies now in the patch are sort of in this in this scenario and probably get even more as time goes on. Why I mention this is because we have to remember there's a lot of people comparing stock prices from today to like 2018, 2016, 2014, which is fine. But if a company has paid off, let's say five dollars a share worth of debt, you have to account for that when you compare the share prices and sort of how low can these share prices go calculation that you're running. So a prime example of this, and I'm sort of digressing here, but a, a prime example of this is, is Meg Energy. When Husky made the deal to buy Meg in 2018, the amount of debt that Meg had was absolutely astronomical. It was, it was through the roof. So that $11 share buyout then correlates to the same enterprise value as a $17 to $18 share buyout today. And maybe something that gets lost here as we transition into this different oil company balance sheet sort of regime is that as that debt is paid off, you have to add that value back to the share price. And so if you're saying that, oh, if oil price drops, white cap's gonna go back to 70 cents or uh, headwater's gonna go back to 90 cents, Maybe not, because at that time, a lot of the value of the company was tied down in debt, whereas now it, it has to be reflected in the equity price uh, going forward. So uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, maybe Headwater and Whitecap weren't the right examples because the, their debts haven't really changed that much uh, from then. But other companies, like I mentioned, like Meg Energy, for example, is, is one that's definitely one where there's an extra three to five dollars in the share price, even from 2020, uh, that needs to be reflected in there. So, adjusted funds flow about 80 million dollars, free cash flow 22. Once again, I've adjusted the free cash flow to account for the seasonality of capex. Um, very, very important in the Canadian oil patch, with the way that capital is spent quarter by quarter. Um, last quarter pricing. One of the best quarters we've had in memory, $108 uh, a barrel a USD. Strip pricing has dropped quite a bit, 74, about $75 uh, a barrel. Uh, WCS, $16 diff. I'm only pricing in a $13 diff right now for WCS. Uh, it has blown out a little bit uh, more than this, but for now, I'm gonna leave my model as is. Um, and then, so the exchange rate, going up a lot uh, to the benefit of our Canadian oil producers. They get paid in uh, Canadian or they get paid in US dollars, but converted into Canadian dollars. So uh, 74, a $75 strip on WTI is, uh, call it over hundred dollars. It's, it's about 105 uh, Canadian dollars a barrel, which is really, really strong. A uh, gas price, Headwater doesn't make damage gas, so we're going to kind of leave that as is. And before I explain this, so for those that haven't joined us in the past for these valuation sessions, I do explain every box in more detail in sort of the sessions from July and before. Uh, since then, I've sort of gone on and just gone through them quick to get to the insight part and the and the final conclusions of the of the model. Uh, there's no point explaining the model every box every single week. So please have a look at those sessions if you want every box by box detail as to sort of what's going on. So uh, we have our four times, uh, or sorry, eight times free cash flow model. We have our four times AFF model, very little hedging with Headwater. They, I believe they do have some hedges. I just haven't put them in there because they're, they're so small. And then production growth. Headwater is growing very, very rapidly. So they have the 11.7 11, in Q2, 
over the next 12 months, I think they're going to average about a 14.5. So 2,800 barrels a day of growth at about $70 a BOE of net back is what I'm going to say. Um, once you have your infrastructure and your roads and your uh, drilling plans and you know et cetera in place, it's it's very simple to drill the clear water and increase production. Just look at look at Baytex, look at CNRL, look at even like Delta Stream. Some of these smaller companies, they're really able to ramp up the clear water very fast because of the conventional low decline production and the way the wells come online. So. Uh, after we get our sort of our final calculation that goes into the price targets spreadsheet at a seventy dollar uh, oil four fifty gas strip we get a dollar eighteen uh, of shares so not really worth all that much but we go into eighty dollar five uh, price environment two fifty nine a hundred dollar five fifty environment we get five thirty eight so roughly where the price is today and when I say this company is trading at a premium that's that's sort of what I mean is Headwater today trades at roughly eight times free cash flow at a hundred dollar oil price environment. That's that's really really amazing uh, that there's companies or already trading at this. Yet I get messages almost once a week saying your model is completely wrong. We're never going to get to eight times free cash flow. Uh, there's already companies out there. Tourmaline trades at seven times free cash flow. That's a major. Um, this month trading at eight times free cash flow at $100. Um, so definitely quite interesting. And then for the high end case, 120 oil, $6 gas, we get 816 a share. So roughly 50% upside from kind of where we are today. So pretty stable company. There's, there's not as much upside as a company that I would personally like to invest in. Uh, that being said, strong shareholder support. The wells are doing really, really good. It's a production growth company. So if they beat on production, obviously the, the price targets go up, uh, but I don't have enough data to prove that they're gonna beat uh, on, their, um, on their production number. I've already given them a lot of benefit of the doubt by saying 14.5 um, for now. Once Q3 comes out, I'll have better vision as to sort of what actually happened and I, I do think this will need to be adjusted upwards. I have quite a lot of confidence in this, in this management team um, as a management team, not as an investment, but as a management team uh, as to what they do. Uh, 2022 capital program, about 230 million. I believe this did get up to about 300 million, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, that was another company. So. This stays at 230 million, and um, that's uh, that's sort of the fair share price target. So, when we look at the company as to sort of what's going on, capital expansion in 2022 to set up 2023 and beyond, um, growth company. That's that's really what they're saying. It's a growth company spending a lot of capital, and they want to set up sort of the the future. I don't really believe these statements all that much because. What you end up getting is if I see the same presentation next year, it's going to say capital expansion in 2023 to set up 2024 and beyond. It's just going to keep saying the same thing because there are management teams and assets that just want to grow. They don't care about return to shareholders. They don't care about dividends. They don't care about share buybacks. They, they couldn't care less about any of this stuff. All they care about is production growth and you know, they may not even care about free cash flow. It's all about production growth in order to sell the company to somebody else. And we know the Clearwater is hot. There's been some massive transactions here in the last year or so. And, you know, Headwater wouldn't even mind if they can grow production another 10,000 BOEs and then sell the whole damn thing to a Tamarack or a CNRL or whoever. Um, and then go out, take the money and start a new company somewhere else and start doing the same thing. So there are management teams that just, that's, that's all they believe in. And we have to give the share prices. We have to treat the company that way. You can't go into headwater and say, we want share buybacks, we want dividends. It's just, it's just not gonna work. Uh, that's not their mantra, that's not their mandate. So 50 million to greater Peavine, 
uh, 70 million to Martin Hills West and then 110 million into Martin Hills. So pretty substantial um, CapEx program. Um, Martin Hills obviously being the best acreage, Martin Hills West being sort of an exploration area and then the greater, the greater Peavine being an even bigger sort of exploration area, but with success in the area. Um, with success in the area by other operators uh, close by. I'm not going to say right next to them, but, but close by. Um, so Josh is asking, can you share your thoughts on implied transaction value of Headwater uh, based on recent transactions? So uh, here's one for you. Delta Stream was 19,000 barrels a day, uh, sold for about 1.4 billion, call it 1.6 with the uh, Topaz royalty. Um, Headwater is, I mean, that's that's not the current production. Let's say current production is about 13, 14,000 uh, barrels a day. So roughly 30% less production than Delta Stream. And the EV is about 30% less than what it sold for. So that to me tells me it's basically fairly valued at what it is. Now I know the Clearwater is not the same. Uh, Delta Stream had a lot of Martin Hills uh, e exposure as does Headwater. Uh, Headwater has some other exploration plays. So on a on a barrel for barrel basis, that's sort of we're we're already fairly priced. There's there's not much upside on a on a buyout uh, candidate sort of um, uh, investment thesis. And the other news or information would be that Headwater came in second in the bidding for Delta Stream. This is not confirmed by me. This is just what I heard. Uh, and they bid roughly 1.1 billion on Delta Stream. So they're saying 19,000 barrels a day was worth 1.1 billion, while they're only at 13 to 14,000 barrels a day, and they're already worth 1.1 billion. So they, it seems like they already know that they trade at a premium to sort of what the market is uh, is uh, pricing these private companies and and other producers at. Uh, yeah, you bet. Um, so. One thing to keep in mind as we finish Q3 here, remember Q3 finishes in five days. When we look at production growth numbers, we can't look at 2022 numbers. It's already nine months into the year and we don't have budgets for 2023 yet. So the next sort of month and a half to two months, it's a lull phase where there's a lot of assumptions being made as to where does, does this company actually end up in the next 12 months. So Headwater is telling us Q4 is gonna be 16.5. Um, if this was a heavy CapEx year, that tells me their first nine months of, of 2023 are going to be maybe 17, 18,000 barrels a day. And if we kind of average that out, that tells me my production growth number is very low. It's on the low end. Right now, I'm just going to run with it, as I said, until I have Q3 numbers and then sort of go from there. Uh, you don't want to put in absolutely high numbers in here and then you get strange numbers coming out of your price targets and then the company misses. Uh, I'll talk about this in Rubelite where they, they gave out production numbers for Q2, Q3, whatever, and they completely missed them. So the clear water especially why? Because the clear water is not, is not a similar reservoir throughout its, um, its acreage. It's very, very different. It's a huge pool and we're getting very different well results. We're getting different results from water flooding. We're getting different IP rates. We're getting all, all sorts of results all over the place. So Headwater is probably telling us these numbers based on whatever they think Martin Hills West and Greater Peavine are going to come out at. We don't know if that's actually the case. They also don't have that much acreage in Martin Hills. They, a lot of the acreage is already under production and is in their drilling plans. So what if the water flood doesn't work out? Well, now you got production targets being lowered. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to be very conservative. If if I was talking about a Montney producer or a Duvernay producer, where we know there are layers, 
that are just homogeneous across the trend, it would be different. The clear water is not that uh, so far. We don't have enough data. If you are a clear water guru and you know somebody working there, whatever, you might have better data than me. Um, but I, on the whole, have just shied away from investing in pure play clear water companies because of that reason. And also because they already trade at a premium. So I'm paying upfront for success that's baked into the corporation. Why would I do that? Uh, when there are other companies that have success not baked into the share price, um, such as Obsidian, for example, in their blue sky clear water acreage. Uh, Q2 exit working capital, 130 million cash. So they have lots of cash on the books. They don't need to dilute. They don't need to raise debt unless they buy something like a Delta Stream and they're spending over a billion dollars, obviously. Uh, so here's the latest map of the Clearwater. This, uh, this doesn't include the Delta Stream acquisition, I believe, uh, so far. Uh, maybe it does. So we see Spur is the biggest clear water producer. They're at roughly 30,000 barrels right now. Delta Stream got bought out. So that's now Tamarack, which also ends up at roughly 30,000. And then you got CNRL with its Smith uh, Headwater and then Baytex Peavine, uh, Wood Code and the Rubelite. So here in yellow is your Headwater acreage. And on this map, it makes it seem like they're very, very close and that this should all be the same reservoir. Well, here is the shadow acreage on the, on the left, and here's their Martin Hills on the right. And this is the Alberta BC boundary. This is the Alberta Saskatchewan boundary. You can see how far away they are uh, in reality. So, you know, the, if you look at maps of the Motney trend and how, and how wide it is, it's, it's way less wide then, then this clear water trend seems to be. So I would not expect similar results from these two zones. Um, we'll find out. We don't have a drill from uh, this shadow area yet. So uh, we'll kind of see what comes out of that. We see very close to Spur, which is probably the most successful Martin Hills operator. Uh, we see Tamarack Valley with its Peavine uh, and then Nipissey area. Uh, water flooding, we see obsidian here in its uh, like dark purpley, light brown. Uh, CNRL right here with its Smith acreage. So a lot of different zones, a lot of different areas, everything sort of being delineated at the same time, other than Nipissey and Martin Hills, which are, and maybe Jarvie, which are sort of the known trends. Uh, they've been delineated but there's still a lot of step out and wildcat activity in the area. So by no means is this play properly mapped or identified yet. There is a lot of exploration going on, a lot of new drills. And what makes all of this possible is that the drills are very cheap. You can go out and drill an eight, eight leg of multi-lat for 1.5, $1.7 million. It's, it's not a big deal for, for these companies uh, to go and drill these wells and sort of take a shot uh, compared to maybe the Montney and the Duvernay where you're talking eight to 10 to $12 million wells uh, where one well, one bad well can sink your entire company proven numer numerous times in the past with uh, Blackbird, with uh, Sequence, with Delphi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, Robert says, uh, shadow looks thick and similar resistivity on logs compared to Baytex P-Vine. Um, but yeah, you know, great point, Rob. Uh, there's so many clays in the zones that mess up log readings uh, that say you have oil, but then you drill and it's water. So this is why I say it's better to be conservative with the clear water than to get way too excited and say, oh, our entire acreage is just phenomenal and prolific. And then you end up looking stupid like Rubelite just did. Um, and I'll talk about this uh, here in the next, next one here. Uh, Neil asked, are you keeping TV? Yeah, Tamarack is gonna stay in my portfolio. I, I think the upside there is just phenomenal. If they stop making deals and they just let the company do what it's supposed to do, um, going into 2023, it's, uh, 
I think it's one that's lagged for so long and the dollar per BOE is so low. Um, and their clear water is actually coming out really, really strong as I'll talk about here as well, uh, just in the next, next uh, slide here. So anyway, they got Martin Hills, they got Shadow, and they got this, this pea vine uh, flare area where they're doing some exploration going on uh, right now. A little bit looks like Nippy C here. Uh, so that's that's a map. I love I love seeing these maps because you really get to know what people are doing, where they're drilling, uh, where the activity is, where the good zones are, and where the good companies are. And sometimes you might see some smaller companies pop up on these maps, like this uh, Clear North Resources and uh, Durham Creek. You know, possibly one where I I go and I look them up. Where are they drilling? And you go to the management and they say, look, do you want to do a private placement for X amount of dollars? Um, and maybe you, you come up with something that's a deal worth taking. Um, and why I mentioned that is because uh, capital is still very, very tight in the industry. And sometimes people don't even know where to look for capital. A lot of your existing sources have dried up and nobody knows where the capital really is. So um, you know, possibly you go into these, you can make, make deals with these management teams and get into these companies at a very early stage. And if the bullish structural outlook pans out, it doesn't have to be right away. It can be in 2023, 24, 25. As the cycle continues, uh, these junior companies obviously get more and more attractive uh, going forward. Um, yeah, so a great point, uh, Rob, again. So always appreciate your insights. Um, oil gravity is a huge consideration, yes. So, you know, if the oil is too viscous, uh, you can't produce it. So you, well, if the oil is too viscous, um, maybe it's just not worth it. You just, you just say, screw it, we're gonna sell it. As uh, Rob mentions, Kiwatnok sold their clear water uh, to Longshore. So, um, you know, Great point. Uh, where's I3 on this map? Uh, I believe this blue color is I3, if I'm not wrong. And then they also own uh, the gas, the gassy part of the clear water, which I don't think is on this map, but I'm actually not, not really aware, to be honest, where, where I3 is on this uh, exactly. They do have some JVs with rubellite, uh, which are in the Martin Hills area, so kind of down here. But other than that, I, I believe this is their position here. So a little bit of history on Headwater and what they've done. It started off as Corridor Resources. They did a 30 million placement in February 11th of 2020. Talk about the worst possible time to raise $30 million. And then COVID hits and oil goes to minus 37 and stays in the $20 range for uh, four to six months. Definitely uh, don't envy them in that situation, uh, especially because the management team themselves, the uh, five of them, I believe, put in $20 million. So you put in $20 million and then the entire thing just tanks uh, and, and you're kind of stuck in there with all this money. Uh, so that was February 11th. Uh, they announced it in January, I believe. Uh, February closed and then March, I think, was when the actual full placement closed. Uh, so they've done really well. It was 92 cents a share back then. They roughly 6x their money in two and a half years. And in addition to that, they got all these warrants that can allow them to buy a share at 92 cents. So those warrants are basically worth another five bucks a share or five bucks a warrant. So in, you know, overall, they... 10, 11 extra money in two and a half years. I think very similar to what a lot of us uh, oil and gas investors have done in the public markets, um, but they've done it on the private side, which is uh, pretty phenomenal. Not really the private side, but through a private placement. And what they did in December, they acquired the Martin Hills from Synovus Energy, about 2,800 uh, barrels per day and 270 sections they paid uh, 35 million cash, they paid 50 million shares, so worth roughly 200 million. 
and then 15 million warrants at $2 a share, which are worth, these have all been exercised and sold, but, but today they would be worth roughly three million or $3 each. So another 50 million. So they paid roughly $300 million at the time, uh, while well, today for the 2,800 barrels per day, they have about four X the production from there. And basically what I'm trying to say is Synovus got shafted uh, as they did with many, many, many deals. I don't know what's wrong with Synovus, but they, they just sold the wrong things. They've sold Pelican Lake, they've sold Suffield, uh, they've sold uh, Weyburn, they've sold this, and they recently bought that refinery that blew up in Ohio. The, the oil and gas gods are just not, not on their side in terms of M&A activity. Um, and just very unfortunate uh, with how things have sort of played out throughout the years. Um, you know, if, if Sonovas had kept on to all these assets, oh, it would be an absolute, like it's already a free cash flow machine but it, it could just be this absolute monster with, with plays all over the place, you know, a la a mini CNRL of sorts. Uh, but that's, that's how the markets go and that's how the oil and, oil and gas industry goes. Um, they did do a good job at selling these shares. They sold 50 billion shares in November at about $4.55 a share uh, in a year. It's only gone up roughly 20% from there. So. Pretty decent uh, uh, sale here, you could say. They took the money, they paid back debt, they accelerated their cash return to shareholders plan. So Synovus has completely gone out now. I believe the exercise of warrants and then sold those as well, uh, if I'm not mistaken on that. And we look at a five-year development strategy here for Headwater. So they wanna grow, they wanna get to 20,000 uh, barrels per day, and then keep it flat into the future. And what have they done? They've acquired another 112 sections of land. They have put 50 million of capital into exploration. And if that capital succeeds, they have another 30 to 50 million allocated. What I find funny about graphs like this is they don't really mean anything because what if Headwater had been successful in buying Delta Stream? This entire graph goes out the window. It means absolutely nothing. Yet they spend all this time running these numbers and how much free cash flow and what the capital is going to be and what the free cash flow is going to be and all this. Whitecap did the same thing. They put out all these fancy charts saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then they end up buying uh, XTO uh, for almost $2 billion. And all this stuff just goes out the window. So uh, it just <laughs> gets me laughing every time when I see this. And then I see the companies bidding on these massive uh, M&A deals. Uh, and I'm like, wh why are you even putting these out if it doesn't mean anything? Like, why not just say we're going to do M&A? Once we have the M&A done, then we'll put out a five-year strategy. Uh, but hey, I've never run a company like this before. So maybe I'm missing something. Uh, Headwater is also trying out some new things here, which is great to see in the clear water. Uh, we don't know the exact science of the clear water yet. It took the Montney four, five, six years to figure out how long should we drill? What's the spacing should be? How much frack fluid do we need? What's the exact fracking method? Uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the clear water is still very new. So what are they doing? They're drilling longer wells. So the longest clear water drill in the basin has been headwaters. Uh, they have oil processing facilities fully commissioned, which is great because it, it reduces your operating cost. It reduces your transportation cost uh, overall, which is really good. If you think the play has a future, it's better to set up processing facilities than to be trucking oil and sending it all over the place. Um, so they drilled a 1.75 mile multilateral uh, here, reducing drilling costs by 30% for now. And they have some water flooding uh, schemes going on. So 
adding sections to injection one by one, you see how the injection sort of builds every quarter. So, you know, every quarter or two, they add one section, uh, which is one mile by one mile uh, into the water flooding scheme. And they sort of keep that going uh, to increase the recovery factor uh, as the wells are drilled and as they start declining. Uh, so here's one that um, Headwater has done. So they have your initial oil rate, you drilled more wells, then they started declining, then they drilled more wells and added this water flooding support in blue. And then it started declining again. And then the water flooding support has just gotten larger and larger. They say the oil decline has been mitigated and the rate is increasing, but it's way too early to tell. I mean, it's been a month and this graph doesn't really look like it's increasing all that much. So I would wait for better data on this. The water flooding is a big, 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 big factor in the clear water. If the water flooding schemes actually work and they can mitigate declines, this is going to be a very, very prolific play, uh, very economic. Um, it's not going to add massive barrels like the Montney or the Permian or the Bakken or whatever, but um, it can be a very low decline conventional play for many, many years. If the water flooding does not work in certain parts of the clear water, you could see the clear water really getting polarized where one part of the clear water is way better than the other part of the clear water. Um, it's too early to tell. We don't know yet. Uh, these water flooding schemes are very new, so we'll find out. Uh, we see the clear water, this um, west Martin Hills. The wells are definitely weaker than the main Martin Hills, which are 300 to 400 barrel per day IPs, uh, IP90s. These are sort of in the 150 to 250 range uh, in west Martin Hills. So there's already a drop off right there from sort of the best wells to the uh, the step out wells, I guess, in the in this zone. Uh, some wells are declining very fast, going down to sort of that 100, 100 plus, 100 to 125 BOEs per day in less than six months. So certainly want to watch. Here's a Tamarack Valley water flood. And I, I discussed this before when I had my Tamarack Valley session that the Tamarack water floods are coming in really, really strong to the point where the water flooding rates that you're getting are more than the IPs of these wells. So the well came on at 300 barrels a day, it sort of declined a bit. And then as the water flooding support came on right away, they didn't wait for the well to decline. They, they put water flooding support right away. The wells are now producing 350 barrels a day, which is not that common in a water flooding scheme. You don't see, you don't see rates going higher than IPs. However, it's not often that water flooding is run right away either. So it does happen, yes, but, but rare. Uh, so this is definitely an encouraging sign. And uh, for Tamarack anyway, if, if other companies choose to take this same technology, which is this tuning fork design, where you have two legs, and then a injector in the middle, and then two legs, uh, oil legs, and then an injector in the middle, uh, tuning fork design, they call it. Um, there's some really, really interesting results coming out of this. So if these companies can prove this going forward, uh, this could be a very, very solid play, uh, especially because the drilling and completion cost is basically very low uh, compared to the IP that are coming out. Uh, so watching, watching the water flood as time goes on here, uh, the greater Peavine area. So here's Baytex with their best in North America wells, uh, wood coat. Here is uh, yellow would be your headwater. Acreage shadow, obviously, as Rob mentioned, kind of the, the newer uh, position here where the logs look really good, but we'll find out what actually happens here. And then the seal walrus area, which is sort of your um, obsidian tamarack. Uh, well, no, this is tamarack. 
um, um, your obsidian uh, and then Baytex also has a lot of acreage in here. So, um, so that's their exploration plan. What I find interesting here is they say, uh, um, they say greater Peavine shadow could be a potential Peavine lookalike. And if we look at the, the Peavine wells that Vtex has been drilling, they're producing eight to 900 barrels a day. Uh, and they've got not just one of them, they've got many of them producing at these sorts of rates. But then they say shadow could provide IPs of greater, greater than 200 barrels a day. It's definitely not a Peavine lookalike if it's only making 200 barrels a day. So the company itself, are they being conservative? Maybe, but I, I don't think it's a Peavine lookalike if it's producing one fourth the amount of barrels uh, that the, that the Peavine wells are. So maybe we should temper our expectations uh, and, and not make comments like this uh, possibly, but anyway, it's too early yet to tell. They have a drill, I think in Q4 and uh, results should be early next year and we'll find out what comes out. Uh, top wells in the Clearwater, Peavine and Smith. You have Baytex with the best acreage, you could say, and then Canadian Natural always finds a way to somehow drill the best wells in every place, every reservoir, every field. They have acreage all over the place, just sitting there. They wait for others to come in, prove it out, do, do the exploration, get the logs, figure out how to drill the best water flooding techniques, and then they come out and they just drill really good wells. Um, similar to what Exxon and Chevron did in the Permian, very similar. Um, so a little bit more about their ESG stuff. So 50% reduction in, in emissions in Martin Hills, uh, very low ARO. So this could be why this company trades at a premium. They have no ARO. This is a brand new company. They started off with pretty much nothing. And $33 million, that's undiscounted, uninflated. Very low for the EV that they have. And they have active partnership with the indigenous businesses in the area, which is very important uh, in, in certain parts of the Canadian oil field. Uh, having a good working relationship is extremely important and they seem to have that. Uh, like I mentioned, the gas asset, not a huge production. They shut, they shut it in in the summer and then they produce it from like November to April-ish. And what's interesting is it used to produce 18 million per year in operating cash flow, but because gas pricing is higher, it's now going to produce double that this year, this winter, $35 million in operating cash flow. So great for something with a maintenance capital of $500,000 a year. It's just an extra free money asset uh, sitting there. And you could see some pricing blowouts this winter because this asset sells into the Eastern Canada slash Eastern US market. So your New York, Boston uh, sort of market. And pricing could, could go through the roof if they can't find uh, middle distillates or, or fuel oils or heating oils, which is looking quite likely uh, as sort of time goes on here. I mentioned Neil Roselle, the CEO of Headwater. He was a CEO, I believe, of Raging River, which Baytex bought in 2018, a summer of 2018, for $2.8 billion. Why, why do I mention this? Raging River was producing roughly 28,000 barrels per day in 2018 when the price of oil was in the 65 to $75 range, they convinced Baytex to pay $2.8 billion, $100,000 per flowing barrel. What did Baytex also get? They got 260,000 acres of East Duvernay shale acreage, which has proven to be not all that great. Um, so why do I mention this? Well. Neil Rosell obviously knows how to make deals and sell companies at premium pricing. So if it trades at a premium, I mean, Headwater already trades at $100,000 of flowing barrel, but in a, in a $100 oil price environment, could they get a massive premium on top of that? 
possibly uh, he's he definitely seems to know how to how to sell. And the final thing about headwater is is the is sort of how the clear water is produced. So this is one section in the clear water. So one mile by one mile. And we see there's about four multilateral wells. Uh, well, more than four, maybe six multilateral wells. And six multilateral wells in this section cost about $10 million. In $10 million, you can produce one section of the clear water. This is the Montney. This is Arc Resources Montney. There's about eight, nine wells per section. This section is going to cost you roughly 60 to $70 million in wells in DCET, drill complete equipped tie-in cost. So 10 million, 60 to 70 million. These come on at two to 300 barrels a day. These come on at 1,000, 1,500 BOEs per day. So quite a bit different, but two years down the road, this is still producing 150 barrels a day. This is down 90% from its 1,000 to 1,500 BOEs per day. So when we compare wells slash companies that are going to do well in a sustained higher oil price environment, especially if inflation becomes a big deal. So your oil field steel, oil field labor, uh, roads, construction, et cetera. There's going to come a point in the cycle where we move fully to conventional oil producers uh, and oil sands producers. My portfolio is sort of already set up that way where I do have Montney exposure, but only to the growth Montney with high condensate yields. I'm really not a fan of these development Montney plays because it's just high cost. It's high decline. It's high inflation. You need a lot of treadmilling to keep these things going. Um, not saying these are bad companies, not saying they're not going to make money, but conventional producers is just so much cheaper. It's just so much better when the cycle works in your favor. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, again, that's not my investment advice or anything. That's just the way that I see the same sort of section here versus this section here. Um, this is also the Permian. So this is, I have a picture of the Montney here, but the Permian works the exact same way. It's uh, maybe even more expensive, maybe 80 to hundred million dollars a section uh, to produce. So keep that in mind. Uh, maybe not important today, but in a, in a sustained cycle, could become more and more important uh, at a time of oil field services shortage, labor shortage, steel shortage, construction equipment shortage, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, so that's that on Headwater. Uh, if there's any questions, if not, we'll move to Rubelite and continue on. Uh, for anyone on the Twitter space, if you want to join for the, for the visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca. Uh, near the bottom there, there's a Zoom link um, to join in for our, our visual Excel session. Uh, if not, continue listening on the Twitter spaces. Uh, okay, so there's no questions here. So we'll move to Rubelite. Much smaller producer in the Clearwater, much more early in its development cycles, about 1,500 barrels per day, 100% oil. 55 million shares, $2 a share, 229, 126 million, uh, again, debt-free. They got 11 million of cash on the books, so worth $115 million. So trading roughly 60 to $70,000 per flowing barrel. So not, not too bad. Uh, adjusted funds flow, 4.6. Free cash flow was actually negative because they lost money uh, as they were spending a lot in capital and the hedging absolutely killed them. They lost $6 million in hedging in Q2. Uh, everything else is the same here, strip pricing as headwater. And uh, they do have some hedges still until the end of Q2 of 2023. No, the end of Q1 of 2023 at 
you know, pretty poor pricing, you could say. And they unfortunately hedged a majority of their production. They hedged like 80% of their production is hedged. Not, not the best company if you're looking for upside in the near, near term. And a little bit of production growth I've baked in, 400 BOEs per day. Uh, I've given them a sort of a higher net back for right now. I don't know if that's going to come into fruition, but I've just left that in there as sort of a proxy for, okay, if they do beat on production, some of the net back goes into that. Um, you know, this is the calculation that I've chosen to run with. And we end up with uh, this company at $70 oil is basically worthless. The equity is, is, is worthless. Um, $80 oil, $5 ACO is 44 cents a share. $100 oil, $5.50 is $141 a share. And then $120 oil, $6 gas is $237 a share, which is roughly what it's trading at today. So this company is trading at roughly eight times free cash flow at $120 oil. Uh, so very, very interesting. That's, that's with 400 barrels a day of growth baked in at $90 a BOE of net back. Uh, so overvalued, likely. What are people betting on? Probably similar as Headwater. They're, they're betting on growth here. They're betting on production beats. They're betting on water flooding support. Uh, they're betting on exploration success. Uh, I choose to stay away from something that's valued this strongly already. Uh, okay, about a $55 million capital program in, in uh, 2022. So we just take that, we run with it, and um, you know, pretty, pretty easy company to understand. You're betting on exploration success. That's it. That's pretty much it. So where is the exploration? So in the second quarter, Rublite executed a farm-in and option agreement in Peavine, which you know is is where the best wells are being drilled if you're in that actual P vine trend uh, that Baytex is in, Baytex would quote Tamarack. And they made this deal with Cavalier Energy and it gives them access to about 35 net sections. And uh, Rubelite can earn up to a 60% working interest uh, in, these, in these acreages. So why is this so interesting? Because Cavalier, I mean, this was already known. Rubelite was the only company that was ever gonna get their hands on the Cavalier energy acreage. Why? Because Cavalier is 100% owned by Paramount. Uh, Paramount Resources, it's about 1.4 million gross acres. So a lot of asset here. Uh, they picked this up from Chevron, I think, Chevron Canada maybe. I can't exactly remember. Uh, Rob, if you're on the call, uh, if you want to let me know. I think it's Chevron. They, they picked up 1.36 million acres. They just left them there. They did nothing with it. They just said, oh, there might be something here in the future. So we'll let the other people do their thing, find the oil, and then we'll go in with this absolutely massive land base and, and find, our, find our oil. And so Paramount 100% owns Cavalier, the CEO, and president and the chairman of the board of Paramount, James Riddell. It's his daughter that runs Rubelite, uh, Sue Riddell uh, Rose, obviously married to Mike Rose uh, of, of Tourmaline. So, um, you know, family connections there. And we knew this, we knew Rubelite was the only company that was ever gonna get access to Cavalier if Paramount didn't drill it themselves. So maybe why there's so much upside sort of in the stock price uh, baked in, people are saying, oh, well, if they have access to this, and this is 1.36 million acres, can they come up with a few different, you know, exploration drills? Can they find even better clear water acreage? Possibly. Um, yeah, so thanks, Rob. It's not Chevron, it's uh, uh, Coke oil sands in 2019 is where uh, Paramount got these lands. Uh, appreciate you hopping on. Uh, thank you. Uh, so here's what happened. Rubelite didn't, didn't drill good wells. They were guiding for 2,300 barrels per day. 
Now they're guiding for 1850. The capex has also gone up. The differentials have gone up. The production cost has gone up, transportation, GNA, everything per barrel has gone up because obviously they're producing less barrels. Uh, but mainly the production has gone down, which is a big, big loss because that tells you that not only are your drills bad, but your overall acreage may not be that good either. Uh, so definitely a, a contra story to your headwaters, your spurs, your tamaracks, you know, one where, where things didn't actually work out as good as they thought. Um, they had October 5th of 2021, they had their equity financings. That was at $2 a share. And March of this year, they had 38 million of more financing at 355 a share. Not doing too well, not, not doing too well. That, that March placement is down roughly 40%. 30%. And people who invested in, in October of 2021 are basically flat. They're up about 15%. In the meantime, other equities have run up 60, 70, 80%. At, at one point, we're up 150 to 200% um, from last October. So we look at the chart, it's down in the last 12 months. Um, there's pretty much no companies that are down in the oil and gas space in the last 12 months. We see the initial loss after the June oil price uh, collapse. And then when they put out the news of them not meeting their production targets, it sort of just slid further from there, uh, from the $3 range down to 229 now where it is today. They have this chart that the Clearwater, Martin Hills and Nipissey are basically the top two rate of return uh, acreages in the Canadian oil patch, which is true. And partly what makes these companies so attractive, right? I mean, that's why we're discussing the clear water. That's why these companies are in this area, why they're paying premiums to be in the clear water and why, um, and why the wells are sort of coming in so nice, why everyone is, is looking to go here, why the equities are trading at a premium because the wells are just so good. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, my bad. It's uh, Suradal is James' uh, sister, not his daughter. Um, they're they're the they're the daughter of Clay uh, Clay Riddell. Um, yes, back again, back from the Paramount days uh, with with Clay there. Um, asset summary. This is. Uh, I'm not sure why they would put this in the corporate presentation. So they have Ucalta, uh, 34 sections, and they got the 19 wells, they got the, the booked wells. Not bad, we know Ucalta is, is a pretty decent uh, area. Martin Hills, they only have 0.9 net sections, which is basically nothing. Uh, when you really think about the development of a company, 0.9 sections is, is nothing to really build out a company. Uh, they got 90 sections in Figure Lake, which they only have eight wells in there. We'll see how Figure Lake kind of pans out. So far, not that great. And then the rest of their 170 sections, so roughly 60% of their acreage has only one well on it. It's uh, kind of misleading to say that you have 298 sections and 60% of that has only one well on it. Uh, it's, it's not even really clear water acreage until you prove at least one or two or three drills in the area. So I've always found this strange and partly why I never really cared about Rublite or investing in it. Uh, it's just, they don't have the right land packages. It seems like uh, Perpetual made a lot of deals to get to get these exact acreages. Can it pan out really well? Yeah, of course. You could get some really, really good wells out of this exploration acreage, but why should I pay a premium upfront for a company like this? If it was trading cheaper, um, you know, possibly I would uh, 
be looking, okay, if it's cheaper, I can, I can buy in. I have this upside potential. Um, but so far, there's nothing like that yet. Um, and I know it's early. Yes, it's not. I'm not here trying to bash the company and being saying, oh, this is complete junk or anything. So far, things have not panned out, both from production standpoint and exploration standpoint. Can it become a new Baytex P-Vine? Yeah, they've got so much acreage that they can drill and find really, really good drills, of course. Um, that's definitely why these companies trade at a premium because somebody believes in them to go out and do exactly that. Um, development step out inventory, they wanna grow production to say 7,500 uh, barrels per day and then sustain that with more exploration for more success. Very similar to what Headwater is saying with their West Martin Hills and Greater Peavine. So let's look at the West Martin Hills. Here's Spurs Wells, about 200 barrels per day. They, you know, three months down the road, they're at 175, 150. Here's another one, 175 to 150. Uh, I'm talking about these wells right here. Spur uh, is drilling these wells right here. And I'm going to show you five of Rubelite's wells, which are sort of these uh, 2021 drills and then 2022 first half drills uh, in black and red. So they're they're basically side by side. They're, I'm not I'm not comparing drills from like further away that it would be irrelevant. These are drills right next to each other. Once again, Spurs drills 175 to 150 roughly uh, 200 to 175, you know, whatever you wanna call it. Here are rubelite drills, uh, green is oil. So the oil rate starts off low because rubelite is using oil-based drilling mud. So you can't claim that in your oil production. Um, you have to put that in as a load fluid, uh, as a load fluid recovery for the first couple months. So that's why the rates are low, which is fine, but the wells never really, pan out. They get to about 60 barrels per day. This well gets to about 50 barrels per day. Uh, this is still a pretty decent well. It gets to 100 barrels per day and stays there flat. Um, this just These wells just came on, but it's down to like 35 barrels per day. And this well is about 50 barrels per day. So um, why, why are the drilling results so poor? you're right next to spur. The logs and the data is, is pretty much out there. I know it's not 100% available data, but it's out there. So something here has gone wrong. If they can fix it in these 2022 and 2023 drills, the greens and the purples, this company is set up to be a, a blockbuster bounce back story. If they can fix whatever went wrong and drill these just these 175 barrel per day wells, production is gonna be back on track. They're gonna meet their targets. They can up their targets and kind of go on from there. What went wrong? I, I don't know. I never looked into this company. I don't know if it's the oil-based drilling muds, if it's certain clays that reacted with a certain type of uh, drilling fluid they were using, if the placement of the legs itself was maybe in the like five meters too high or five meters too low. It could be a variety of reasons. Um, and the market obviously has, has tanked them for that. But if you believe that the, they can fix whatever went wrong and drill these spur like wells, well, this company is going to make a lot of money and the share price is going to react accordingly. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm not gonna tell, make conclusions as to what's happening. Uh, as Michael said, it's too early, um, but we can only go off the data that we have so far. Uh, so uh, that's that. Here is their Yukalta oil type curve so far. So the spur wells, you can see how they're sort of better. They're just better. Um, there's some, some wells that just have not come on strong which means the type curve is not looking all that great. You're below type curve, which we don't say very often uh, these days. Uh, 
But again, this is where opportunities are found. If you think that they can fix whatever's wrong, they can bring these lower wells up here higher, well, then maybe it's trading cheaper than, uh, than its other clear water competitors in the area. Um, I just don't care to speculate on these sorts of things. And so it's a company that I haven't really even looked at for entering the portfolio. Uh, it's, it's just too much speculation. It's hard to read logs in this area. There's a lot going on. The multilaterals are just a new technology to begin with. Uh, and I don't know the acreage. There's very little activity in this side. And like I said, the clear water is not homogeneous. There's, there's all sorts of differences within the acreage. Um, these are a few more wells. These are from the Figure Lake area, which as I mentioned here is, their, is sort of their other large acreage area. So the black and the red is what they've drilled. Very, very early yet, but it's all we have to go off of. So we have to take that as the data that we have. Uh, the greens are the undeveloped and the pink, I believe, is the drilling planned, uh, the drilling plans uh, that are coming up shortly. So 100 barrel day well, this one came on at 100 barrels, went down to 70, uh, 100 barrels, it's declining pretty fast to 50. Uh, this one was not really good well, uh, 50 and then 50. So again, not good wells. The Do they still pay out? Yeah. Most likely, yeah, because it's so cheap to drill in the clear water and the decline rates are so low that these wells likely still pay out. Uh, but when we compare it to the rest of the clear water, making 150, 175, 200 P vine at 800 barrels per day, it's not really the type of exploration success that we like to see so far. It's only five wells, so it's early. But again, I'm not going to give them credit to say, oh, well, they're just learning and they're going to figure it out here. It's not something that I would personally pay for, but if they prove me wrong, hey, kudos to all the shareholders who took, who took that leap of faith and, uh, and went with it. Uh, the clear water is very, very early yet. There's a lot of exploration to be done. There's a lot of technology uh, fix-ups to be done. You can explore different ways, maybe Maybe the wells don't come on strong, but once you put water flood on it, they really shine. We don't know. We'll find out over the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months. Uh, Martin Hills, three crow sections, 0.9 net sections. Not really something I focus on that much because they're tapped out. They're basically done. After these drills in uh, Q2 of 2022, there's basically nothing left here. Uh, well, other than these that are being drilled in kind of as we speak, there's no acreage left. There's no real point spending much time on it. Uh, single pad batteries, volume struct. So this is definitely going to add to operating cost right now. If they can prove out any of these areas, Figure Lake, Yukalta, uh, their, their other exploration assets, and they create batteries, they create processing infrastructure, the operating cost is going to come down. Uh, so very, very early. Again, we can't take the OPEX number as a real number so far. Uh, that will come down if they, if they prove these fields to be economically successful. And the base oil load fluid, as I mentioned, any rubellite well, any well that's using base oil as its load fluid we cannot use the first month or two of oil production. It's going to be not correct. We need three, four, five months of data to show what the actual oil production is after load fluid has been recovered. And the exploration, like I mentioned, this is where, if you're a shareholder, this is where you're really putting your money into. You're saying the land acquisition is gonna go good, the you call the secondary zones are going to go good. The Aspen prospect, a prospect, the northern Clearwater acreage, uh, Peavine, Dawson, Kadoff, and 
any of these fields could prove out really, really successful and completely transform this company. And when that happens, the share price will move up accordingly. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you, Michael. The, the, the 50 BOEs per day wells are still good, yes. And they still pay out, yes, and it's still good. Um, lots of risk for sure, yeah. But um, my whole point is I'm not gonna pay upfront for the premium on that. If, if this was trading at eight times free cash flow at um, $80 oil, maybe it's worth looking into. But from my perspective, it's not. But if they hit, let's say they hit one well, just one well in the P vine area that they're farming into that comes on at four, five, six, 800 barrels per day, you bet this company is gonna go absolutely rocket. The, the share price is absolutely gonna go through the roof uh, because there's not, not that many shares to begin with. And all they need is one well to come on similar to CNRL Smith or Baytex Pvine. that's it. And there's lots of unexplored clear water acreage. So they could definitely hit that sort of well. Uh, it's not out of the question. Uh, so it's more of an exploration play than it is a development play on their existing assets. Uh, so yeah, great point. Uh, and their GNA, um, you know, this is the other thing as operating cost comes down, GNA is the same thing. So as you have more production, your GNA cost comes down. So if it's 550 a BOE today, it's gonna to come down to 250 a BOE. Um, I mean, 2025 is a bit too far out, but it's gonna come down either way. And it adds to your net back, it adds to your free cash flow as a company, uh, as the company gets bigger. Um, so yeah, that's that on Rublite. Um, I think, you know, sort of, you could make a very, very compelling case for this company both ways. You could say it's just not worth buying, or you could say, one drill could absolutely transform this company. So why would you not buy it, right? You could, you could make a case both ways for it. And that's what makes the Canadian oil patch so interesting. There's a company for everybody. There's uh, exploration plays, there's plays that are debt-free and then paying back cash, 100% cash. There's companies uh, sanctioning projects. There's companies with 10, 11% dividends. Uh, there's companies buying back huge amounts of the shares every month. So all sorts of plays uh, out there. Uh, okay, so that's that on Rublite. And if there's any questions, if not, we'll move to uh, Kiwidno. Um, yeah, I... Okay, uh, so... Uh, Kiwitno, Energy Corp, uh, another kind of a newer entrant to the sector. They have been around for quite a while, actually. And the, the original theory was Pat Carlson founded Seven Gens, uh, Seven Generations Energy, which became a huge success story in the Montney, grew from zero to 200,000 BOEs per day in five years. Very, very aggressive company. Uh, really proved out the Montney, developed that CACWA car asset, uh, which is still going today, owned by Arc Resources. And Pat said, you know what? I think I can do the same in the Duvernay. Well, where, where was the open Duvernay land? It wasn't in the Fox Creek, Valley View, uh, K-Bob area, because it was already taken up. It was in the East Duvernay, East Shale Duvernay uh, area near Red Deer, uh, sort of just north of Calgary, actually, not, not that far from there. And what they did, they farmed in with Journey Energy, uh, a name many of us know. Uh, they drilled a couple East Duvernay wells, came on pretty strong, uh, but not economic. They, they didn't end up being all that economic to, to build out uh, Kiwitno, similar to how Seven Gens was built out. So, you know, two, three, four years down the road, they abandoned that project. They ended up buying, um, I believe it was Ovintiv's Duvernay uh, back in the West Duvernay, the original Duvernay area, 
but a bit of a step out off of that and uh, bought that asset, uh, paid a pretty decent price for it. Actually, they, they bought it, I believe in early 2021, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they've been kind of drilling, drilling that acreage, proving it out, expanding their, their production there and uh, doing really well at it. So about 16,800 BOEs per day, 49% oil slash liquids, 51% gas. They got 6,400 light oil uh, condensates, 1870 NGLs. Again, very low share count, 44 million, uh, $14 a share, uh, 55 million of debt, very low debt. So, you know, again, a lot of companies are, are becoming very close to debt free or running very low debt to equity uh, ratios. Uh, pretty interesting, about $700 million EV. So on a dollar per flowing, flowing barrel basis, uh, flowing BOE basis, you know, relatively cheaper than their Clearwater peers. Uh, yeah, about 50% cheaper than a headwater, uh, for example. And, you know, that's where I talked about $10 million to drill a clear water section, 70 to $80 million to drill a Duvernay Montney section, higher decline rates on the unconventional shales. So pretty decent adjusted funds flow, free cash flow. They lost a lot of money in hedging, 32 million in Q2. Similar story to a lot of companies. Uh, hedging is dropping off as time goes on. We have our strip pricing and gas pricing. Uh, we have our hedges, you know, about half of their oil production is hedged this year at $75 Canadian. And then into next year, about a quarter is hedged at $88 Canadian for the first two months. No, nope, for the entire year. So not too, too bad into next year, but this year definitely taking its toll. Um, gas production also is hedged at about $4 Canadian a gigajoule. So not that good hedging, they kind of got stuck, I think, in some sort of hedging push when they bought the, the Duvernay acreage, uh, but it is what it is. And I've put in roughly 3,200 BOEs of growth at a $40 net back uh, right now. So I'm saying they're gonna be at roughly 20,000 uh, for the next 12 months averaged. And where does that put us? That put us uh, at $80. Uh, oil, $5 eco gas, about $16.46 a share. So 20% upside from where we are, roughly 15 to 20%. At $100 oil, $5.50 gas, we get $23.42, so about 70% upside. And then at $120 oil, $6 eco, we get $30.37 a share, uh, 30.37. So I'll call it 110% upside from where we are today. So pretty decent numbers. And then you get the upside, obviously, if they beat on production and drill better wells. Uh, $300 million capital program. That includes their upstream and their, what they call green projects. So I'll talk about this as I go on, uh, but they're also spending money on other green projects. Pretty simple company to understand. There's really not, not much to it. They're, they're expanding this Duvernay. They've got land to expand it. They've got lots of drilling inventory. Um, and if they can keep drilling good wells, well, production is obviously gonna beat. And in a higher oil, higher gas environment, these wells do really well. However, the Duvernay is not easy. It, it, it is a technically challenging area. It is a geographically challenged area. It suffers from very high inflation to the point where some of Kiwitno's uh, drills this year are running north of 12, $13 million a well. So when you're comparing them to seven to $10 million Montney wells, keep in mind the production has to be that much greater to account for that. These are very high decline wells. Uh, especially on the oil rates. The, some of the Duvernay can decline at 90% in the first year uh, in their oil rates. The, the gas rate kind of hangs in there, but the liquids is really where the money is made. So definitely as, as they drill more and more wells, I'm gonna be watching the six month decline rate 
12 month decline rate, 18 month decline rate, you know, further into the future, because that sort of is a proxy for how the rest of their acreage is going to do. Um, so right off the bat, uh, lots of vice presidents, I've been critical of this in the past with other companies, uh, not, not something that I really like to see. I know they have ENP upstream, they got green energy, they need more management personnel, uh, but 11 personnel for 17,000 BOE per day company, uh, maybe it means something to you, maybe it doesn't. Uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, the, the company itself on their first page of their corporate presentation has a EV and then a, a windmill and a solar panel. So they're really pushing this, we are a green company narrative, uh, whether that comes from them internally or it comes from Arc Financial, I don't know. Uh, they figure that's where that's that's what gets people excited. That's where the money is. So nothing I can say to that. That it is what it is. Uh, pretty interesting slide here as well. They show hydrocarbons, the market, coal power, and hydrogen as emitting CO two, and then they show wind and solar as being completely carbon. They don't emit any carbon. Uh, so again, <laughs> it's a slide that I don't really agree with. I don't think it's accurate. I think it's it's purposely misleading, but it fits the kind of investor that they're trying to get. So they're not stupid. They're not putting these out because they truly agree with these sorts of things. And I, I'll say that flat out. Uh, there's a certain kind of investor that likes these sorts of things. And if they can make money off it, why not? Why not? I, I would do the same thing. Uh, so 10 year targets. Uh, so they got 300 million of gas of production. They got 90% carbon capture and clean hydrogen production. Um, buzzwords, 10 year targets. We will, we will see what actually happens, uh, but 10 years is just way too long. Is You're telling me 2032, you're gonna have this. It's just way too long. It's past most investors' investment uh, timeframes, and it, it leads to a lot of gray area as to what actually is happening and what's just put out there. Um, this is a slide I really like because this is kind of exactly what's going on throughout the industry is every company is trying to achieve net zero from a reportable emissions perspective. So they're not really net zero. They have their emissions, they have other emissions, but then they get credits that make them net zero. This is very different from an actual carbon capture model that's something like a Cardinal or white cap runs where actual carbon gets stored in the ground in perpetuity. So you emit a bunch of GAGs and then you get a bunch of credits because you're producing other amounts of power, therefore you're net zero. Do I blame them? No, no. Every, every company should be doing this exact thing. If, if somebody's gonna pay me $60 a ton to not do this or to do this or do that, yeah, for sure. Um, why not? That's, that's where the money is to be made. So, and if the governments are willing to dole out cash for that, well, we got to invest in companies that make money from that cash. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to beat around the bush on this topic. I think it's, it's something that's completely not solving the problem. It's not making any real impacts except putting money in people's pockets who realize how to make money off these credits. Uh, that's exactly what it's doing. So um, it is what it is. And if you believe that this company can make money off that, it's a great investment thesis because the carbon credit game is going to continue on for a long, long time. It's not, it's not just going to be here and then suddenly get wiped out. It's, uh, it's here to stay. And the other thing is in Canada specifically, the federal government has said, if you start a project today, and the carbon pricing changes, as in 
we don't get to that $170 a ton by 2030, they will actually pay you for that even if the carbon pricing doesn't get there. So they're guaranteeing you that if a future government comes in, they change the rules on what the carbon pricing is, you will still get paid as if that carbon pricing had gone on that staircase to $170 a ton by 2030. If I'm seeing that and I see an investment thesis that can, that can take advantage of that, of course I'm gonna invest in that. Like you, you'll be stupid not to. So just keep that in mind. The Canadian government is providing guarantees of that. So you don't even need to believe in, is this government gonna come in and reduce this or do that? It doesn't matter. They're still gonna get paid. Um, so Ken says CO2 is released making wine. Uh, wine holds back some of the CO2 to create bubbles. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really wanna get started on the sources of CO2, but uh, a great point. Um, so this was a little bit of history on their, their journey with Journey Energy. Uh, they, they drilled a couple of vertical wells. They drilled these um, commitment wells and then the five option wells, which I believe the option wells never got drilled. It was just the two commitment wells and maybe one or two option wells. And then the whole thing got, got kiboshed because the East Duvernay was just not, not that attractive compared to other uh, stuff out there. And it's not just these two companies that got, that got stuck in this. Crescent Point bought like 200 and something thousand acres of East Duvernay shale that went absolutely nowhere. And um, Baytex is still working on it. And, and it looks like they can make it an economical success, but we'll see. We need more data and more drilling. Um, so Kiwitno is also doing about two or 1950 megawatts of renewable electricity generation not really 850 of solar, 1100 of gas fired. So natural gas going, creating electricity. Um, other companies are doing this on a much smaller scale. Uh, these, these guys are just going crazy with 1100 megawatts of it. If you value that at $2 a megawatt or $2 million a megawatt, two and a half million, you can kind of see that there is an investment thesis here in this electricity generation, uh, if they can actually make it happen uh, into the future. And there's, the reserves are really, really good. Uh, at the 2021 year end pricing regime, which is $73 oil and roughly $3 ECO, about $30 of uh, 1P reserves and $47 of 2P reserves. So they have a lot of reserves and as the value comes back to these net asset values and reserves, you will definitely see some of these companies get more and more value for this. Uh, not, not just oil and gas reserves, but land infrastructure, uh, pipelines, et cetera. A management ownership, 3.4%. So pretty decent for a company this big. It's actually quite strong. Uh, could it be higher? maybe, um, but, but that is what it is. We see potential power project FID by end of 2023. And this is where the entire story starts to unravel in a way. FID, FID means final investment decision. So by the end of 2023, they're going to decide if they wanna go ahead with these solar and gas projects in 15 months. After that, it's gonna take two to three to five years to get these projects actually running. So you're really betting on a, a, a long, long period of investment thesis here. Secondly, they don't have money for it. They, they're going to do deals, farm-ins, JVs, uh, debt, uh, debt, access to debt, uh, in order to get these projects going. So you're really betting on them executing on this strategy over a five to 10 year period is really, is really what you're betting on. And like I said, most investors just don't have that sort of 
investment time frame, especially in the oil and gas sector. But hey, it fits a certain kind of investor, so it's there and it's trading uh, in the open market. And I, again, the gas projects of the 1,100 that they say they can do, only about 10% of that will even be FID'd by the end of next year. So it's it's not quite accurate what they're putting out here. Uh, these are just planned projects, which really means nothing until they are funded, they're FID'd, and they are starting the execution phase of them. So switching back to the oil, uh, here is their Simonette area. The, here's a Placid uh, area. They've got a few gas plants that they already own, which is a bonus. Um, lots of land near pipeline as well. They're, they have Q1 2023 production. So five months from now of 23,500 BOEs a day. So they're saying production is going to go up 7,000 BOEs by then, about 50%, roughly uh, 40%. Again, there, there's a little bit of risk here, but they've been drilling good wells. They have, they've already already drilled these wells, they've fracked them, and they're coming onto production. These Duvernay wells are not cheap and they're not fast. You can spot a well in December of one year. It's not going to come online till like September, October of next year. There's that much delay in these Duvernay wells in the bush, in the in the jungle. Uh, you know, literally is where they are. So four wells are expected on stream in late Q3. So as we speak, we'll see what the results of these sort of come out to be. Maybe with their Q3 results, they will they, they will give us some IP numbers, IP 30s maybe, uh, will give us better clarity on what's happening. Uh, their best well is a really, really good well. It's five MMCF of gas and 800 barrels of condensate since February. That's that's a really, really good well uh, for being in the Duvernay. And they've got some other cost optimizations and all this, but I wanna focus on this well. Five MMCF per day of gas and 800 condensate. If we look at this well, it's actually producing roughly eight MMCF per day of gas today. So the reason they have to say five is because when the well came on, it was producing about three and then four, and then six, and then seven, and then eight. When you average that out, it becomes five MMCF per day. But this well is actually much stronger than that. It's uh, it's about a seven to eight MMCF per day well, uh, five months in. And uh, the, the condensate number as well is hanging in there, which is really solid. I mean, this well is, is, is really good. Uh, a Duvernay well, even if it costs them 10, 12, 13 million, I mean, that's a really good well. However, the rest of the wells are not as good. The, so they're, they're sandbagging on this well. They're not telling us the real story. The well is way better than what they tell us, but the rest of the wells are not as good. The, the second well right next to it is about three MMCF per day already. So it's already declining. Um, and then the third well that they drilled is about four and a half MMCF per day. Um, and there's something wrong with the condensate reporting in this area. We don't get the live condensate number. This well does have it here, uh, I believe 800 barrels per day. But uh, you know the, these wells, we don't have the data, which is sort of bad because Somebody looking at this well who doesn't know that is, is thinking, oh, this is an absolute garbage well. It's only producing 65 barrels a day of condensate. It's the absolute junk. Well, there's a huge delay in, in, in the reporting here for some reason. Um, so one to keep in mind, if you're looking at these numbers on Petroninja on whatever other software, it may not be 100% accurate. Um, so Josh says their East Duvernay wells were way over budget, close to 20 million a well. So it's hard to make a well pay out when you pay 20 million. So uh, thanks for that, Josh. Uh, and yeah, Cliff says this focus on carbon reduction at all costs has skewed the relevance of these projects. Uh, 
at some point the subsidy schemes will come crashing down. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Uh, which is why I just choose to, in almost all cases, I choose to stay away. The only company I really believe in is that Advantage Energy with their Entropy project. I think that's a real solid project that has really good rate of returns at various sorts of uh, places where they can put this technology and they have a first mover advantage. But um, I'm not sure about these solar projects and all this. Uh, maybe I'm just, I just don't understand them and I'll leave it at that. I don't care to understand them. Uh, so again, as we see these three wells that I just talked about, they were spud in August of last year. So the drilling started in August. They didn't come on production until about February of this year. So there's a six to eight month gap, um, which is why the production is often delayed with the CapEx being spent early. And then the production comes in six to eight to 10 months later. Um, they recently closed an acquisition, another acquisition here in the Placid Montney. They paid $58 million and they're saying the facility and land value is about $38 million. Uh, based on facility replacement value and recent land transactions, they are not gonna get value for this until they do. So right now the market says, we don't care how much land you have. We don't care how much gas plants you have, how much pipelines you have, but there is gonna come a time when these things become more and more valued, especially as the supply chain doesn't seem to be easing up. Some of the compression, the MCCs, the pipeline, the steel equipment is just getting more expensive and harder to find to begin with. You can't even, you can't even buy it if you wanted to, because uh, it's not here. Uh, so they got four gas processing facilities, 198 MMCF per day of capacity. I would say one MMCF per day of capacity today, if you wanted to build it out, would cost you $1.5 million. So because this is a little bit used, it's a little bit older, you can say it's worth $1, one million per MMCF per day. So there's about $200 million of value in the gas plants uh, right here, along with the fact that the gas plants are already there. So you don't have to build anything. As they grow production, they just put it into these gas plants. Their, their Simonette facility has 50% spare capacity. I've made this point before. If you fill up your gas plants, your costs go down a lot because a lot of the costs on a gas plant are capital, upfront capital, and then fixed costs. So no matter how much it's running, 5%, 10, 20, 50, 100, the fixed cost is a fixed cost. The variable cost is very low. So as they grow, their OPEX will come down, their transportation will come down, their processing cost per BOE will come down. And they have an expansion opportunity at Simonette, which they seem to be doing. They seem to be going ahead with this and they're gonna increase it another 50 MMCF per day, which means they're setting up for a really strong growth phase here uh, going forward. Uh, they also have C5 capacity, so oil, uh, capacity as well, which is great. And uh, I'll discuss this a little bit more here further on, but undeveloped acreage. A lot of these companies, and why I'm so happy with Whitecaps XTO deal, is it's undeveloped acreage. It's not in the reserves, it's not in the land values, it's, it's nowhere, it's just land. And as they prove it out, as they drill wells, that gives them not only a production boost, but also a lot of reserve value comes out of it. Because with one well, you, you have all this undeveloped land that you can associate reserves to. Whereas if it's drilled out land, you might drill a well, but there's no land to drill more. So you don't get any reserve extra uh, value with that. So something to keep in mind with these developments in undeveloped acreages, there's a few companies that are in this sort of phase. Uh, so quite exciting stuff as they prove it out. Um, now, for those people who don't like eco gas exposure, you're not happy with the ups and downs. Uh, Kiwitno sells 90% of their gas to Alliance in Chicago, which is a premium priced hub. 
a very, very solid hub uh, with, with firm transportation capacity for both oil and gas, uh, NGLs as well, I believe. So we look at their average realized price. Q4 of last year, ACO was five bucks. This company got 664. Q1, 517 ACO. This company got 635. And then Q2, ACO was 789. And Qwitno got almost $10 in MCF. So way higher realizations by selling into Alliance. However, keep in mind, it costs about a dollar extra per MCF to send that gas to Alliance. So even though you're getting a dollar extra per MCF, you're paying a dollar extra for transportation. So they need to get at least a dollar extra. Anything above that is a real profit. Uh, so keep that in mind. ACO is cheaper to sell into when you're seeing companies sell into NYMEX and Chicago and uh, SUMAS and all this. Keep in mind, there's additional processing and transportation cost associated with that. It's not, it's not just free to start sending gas all over the place. Um, yeah, thanks, Michael, for joining us. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so there's so so just keep that in mind. ACO is not always a negative thing to be exposed to because it's cheap and it's always there. Um, they they did make money off Alliance. They made roughly I think eleven million dollars is what this is trying to say. So what they did, they contracted more gas on Alliance than what they actually produce because they're a growing company. In the meantime they started buying gas from ACO and then selling it into Alliance and gaining that extra dollar per MCF or uh, you know, whatever it is. Um, so it's a pretty solid Duvernay oil asset base. And now we'll get back to the green, green energy stuff. So their land planning. It says their land planning begins with well-designed longer laterals more multi-well pads means less land use and less disturbance. Yeah, correct. That's absolutely correct. You get you get better economics as well. Maybe you should have mentioned that. Uh, and it's what everybody's doing. And then they say this preserves biodiversity. And this is where things get a little bit crazy. Like they are really pushing this ESG narrative using all the, all the right buzzwords and for an investor like me, it, it just it just drives me away from companies like this because I'm I'm not sure whether they are really making money off these things or they just put it in there to kind of fit fit the narrative or or the where the money is flowing into um, sort of thing. They talk about what they're running here. The upstream gets one to six times EBITDA, uh, EV to EBITDA. Whereas the renewable power, they say, is getting 12 to 15 times, which is probably correct in the American market, but there's no real examples of an ENP company that also does renewables and is getting 12 to 15 times valuation on, on the renewable portion of it. Um, maybe Tidewater Renewables, I'm not sure, but it's, it'll be up to them to prove it out for this to actually work. And when we look at their solar project, uh, it's NPV8, so not NPV10, which is how the oil projects are usually seen. So they've used NPV8. It's also before tax. So they're already playing with the numbers a bit. And despite all that, the internal rate of return is 11.3% on the solar project after all the subsidies and credits. So I bet you there's a lot of wells in the oil and gas space that have an IRR of greater than 11.3%. And this is where as an investor, you got a question, um, do you really believe these renewable power valuations are going to come to fruition? Are you willing to wait three, five, seven years for these projects to happen? Because in the meantime, remember what's happening your free cash flow is being spent on capital for green projects. It's not going back into oil and it's not coming to you in dividends or share buybacks. It's going back into green projects 
that are not going to be in service for the next two to three to five years. So I'm gonna leave that up to you. It's not up to me to make decisions uh, for people. It's a, it's a very different kind of investment here. They are using the oil asset base as a free cash flow machine that feeds the green energy projects. And there's, there's no other company like this other than maybe you could say Razor Energy is doing this, but on a much smaller scale. And also they're, they're using the projects as a carbon, like a, a CO2 EOR play, less so a solar and wind play. Uh, so anyways, uh, to each their own on that. The, the share ownership is very, very concentrated. 62% with Arc Financial, 12% with Luminous, 3.4% with management and about 22% is the public uh, market share. You could see this as good or bad. It could be good in that you have these strong legacy shareholders. You could see it as bad in that both these companies, uh, not both, Arc Financial is a private equity fund. They will be looking to exit at some point. It will be very hard for a company like Kiwitno to go and market itself and sell while its projects are like halfway done. Its solar and wind projects are halfway done. So now you're taking a bet. Do you think Arc Financial hangs on for five to seven years? Or will they slowly look to liquidate their position, putting pressure on the share price as time goes on? I don't know. I don't have an answer for you on that. Um, it, it'll depend on your perspective uh, as to what's happening. Arc Financial has been liquidating a lot of their oil positions to move into some of the renewable plays uh, going forward. So uh, definitely want to keep in mind. Here are their projects that they're talking about. So when we look at the capital cost on all these projects, uh, we're into the $3 billion uh, range. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of free cash flow that has to be spent to get these projects online. And the earliest that any of these projects can come online is Q3 of 2025, all the way up to the first half of 2028. So it's more of a investment investment, not a trading position, not a, not a betting on some cycle you're actually go, probably going to end up investing in this company for a long, long time, almost like a private equity position as opposed to a public markets uh, position. So I don't know much about these projects. There's some solar, there's some that are uh, wind, and then there's some that are the gas, burning gas to produce electricity sort of projects. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure what the, internal rates of returns are on, on all of these, they don't give it to you, uh, but maybe somebody could run the numbers if, if you knew enough about the way these work uh, going forward. And Alberta electricity production by type, despite all this boost in renewables, we still remain 70% gas all the way until 2035 is what the projection is by the company. This is not my, my projection, this is what the company projects. Um, so natural gas is going to remain strong, it seems like for a long time in Alberta, uh, despite these re renewable projects. And one of the rumors I heard was that there's a lot of people mad with this company because they've, they've got a lot of capacity stuck. So the way the system works is they only allocate X amount of megawatts of renewable power per year in the sort of the waiting to be FID stage. And what Kiwitno, uh, Kiwitno did is just went and took all the capacity and it's not coming online for the next five to seven to 10 years. So in the meantime, nobody else can even sign up for projects because there's only so much capacity that can be in the uh, conveyor belt, if you will, uh, to come online. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but they do have almost two 
gigawatts of capacity uh, are stuck, um, not coming online anytime soon. And the last thing, probably the only thing that gets me attracted to this company is the unbooked locations, uh, which is your, your reserves that are on undeveloped land. So their two peer reserves at $44 a share is only about 125 net locations. On top of that, they have about 450 unbooked locations that are yet to be put into reserve reports. And keep in mind, reserve reports for 2021 were run at $73 oil, $3 ACO. So $44 a share of value right now with 125 locations. There's 450 extra locations that are going to go into reserves as they drill wells. And the pricing regime that the reserves are run at is going to increase. And you can see how, how this company can become very attractive if they can keep drilling really, really solid Duvernay and Montney wells. Um, that being said, there's other companies in a very similar position uh, that, that are in the exact same position without the renewables green spin on top of that. So uh, that's this company, a uh, very simple company that can become very complicated if you actually wish to dive into the solar project rates of return, the wind projects, the uh, gas, gas combustion to electricity projects, uh, their Duvernay drills, the reserve reports, et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so Cliff just said it bang on. Kiwitno uh, has done everyone a favor by tying up the megawatts because what's happened is in the meantime, nobody else can bring on any projects, which means renewable energy, uh, renewable energy projects or capacity that's out there is just going to be stuck for the next few years, which means more demand for natural gas. Um, I, I don't wanna say it's, it's, it's a positive or a negative, it just is what it is. And we need to uh, understand that for like the ACO slash Alberta intra, intra Alberta gas demand for the next few years is basically going to stay where it is because of this sort of dynamic uh, that exists right now. Uh, so yeah, thanks Cliff uh, for that in, uh, information. And with that, I think um, I'm gonna wrap this up. Uh, three, three sort of newer companies to the block and a, a company for everybody, as I say, there's different investment styles, different investment theses, uh, different portfolio constructions that are out there. So it's nice that we have so many options um, to, to invest into and uh, you know, be quite an interesting week here coming up. I think uh, once again, we, we have this tussle, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have the American Fed hell bent on increasing rates, slowing down the economy and getting inflation under control, which is creating a stronger dollar. Uh, because America is raising faster than the rest of the world. Um, in the meantime, you have oil demand that just refuses to go down. And China has seemingly reopened as of probably five to seven days ago. Um, tracking flights, like I said, in Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Guangzhou, uh, Chengdu, and Shenzhen. And we're seeing very, very good ramp ups in that. Um, the one thing I would look for is Chinese international flight demand. If that starts to ramp up, I think we, we should be on the lookout for an, an additional up to two, maybe two plus million barrels a day of oil demand that could come out of China in like three months of time. If that economy starts to ramp up, if they give stimulus as well on top of that, you, we should watch out. And this is at a time when Chinese inventories are down about 75, 60 to 75 million barrels a day um, in the last, call it three months. 
And I just ran Vortexa. Um, I just ran Vortexa floating inventories. So if we open this here, uh, just to give people a little bit of information, this is Chinese floating inventories. They had roughly 50 million barrels built and then they drew it down. And now it's basically, there's almost nothing left in Chinese floating inventories as well. So uh, this country can really ramp up and affect demand. Uh, I mentioned the Russian oil uh, flows. So when we look at oil flows um, out of Russia, uh, we do it by, do, 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 do. let's say we don't split it. Um, this is Russia excluding the Novorossiysk port, which is where a lot of the CPC Kazakh barrels go out. Um, we're seeing roughly a drop off of 400,000 barrels month over month in Russian crude exports uh, out of these, out of all their ports combined. So um, the market doesn't, doesn't seem to know this, nor, nor do I see any news releases on Chinese flight demand picking up substantially uh, in certain cases. So again, it's the Fed and, and all that against Russian barrels dropping off against oil demand not dropping off. Uh, the gas to oil switching, which should start right away. We see Northwestern Europe gas demand has already gone higher um, along with obviously the uh, sort of just a general reopening of, of everything. Uh, we saw Hong Kong recently say they're gonna abolish the testing and the quarantine procedures. We saw the Canadian government finally come out and say they're gonna uh, remove that app and the, the uh, what else was it? The some sort of testing requirement or something. So I think more economies are realizing it's time to just go flat out, open right up and uh, sort of see what happens. Uh, so it's all marginal but the marginal barrel is the one that's priced on the markets. So uh, it's, it's really those two factors. And you know, what's, what's really interesting to me is that if we remove China from the equation, oil demand has just not gone down despite the rising recessionary narratives, despite the talk about the funds rate is gonna collapse this and collapse that. And we talk about the, uh, the US dollar getting stronger against the other currencies, oil demand has not, not gone down. Oil demand X China is basically where, where it is. And um, you know that's, that's really what it is now. And I see a lot of people victory lapping because the macro took over, uh, et cetera. And you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say here that I was, I was right on that. They, they definitely got some part of that correct. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the bounce back from this is going to be equally as volatile and um, catch it's going to catch people off guard uh, when when the real oil under supply comes to the forefront i don't think any amount of narrative and news and talk can stop a two to three million barrel a day undersupplied market from really going upwards until it finds its demand destruction point uh, which this time around, maybe a little bit higher. Why? Because the crack spreads with, with Chinese product export quotas going up um, and some of the refineries coming online in Kuwait and where was the other one? I want to say it was in Saudi um, and one in Malaysia too, I believe. With these refineries coming online, we should see the crack spreads go down, which means it took us $180 a barrel crude plus crack to hit that demand destruction mark in June. While this time, if the crack spreads only $30 or $40, uh, I think you can all do the math on where, where sort of we end up. So uh, that's sort of where we, I'm positioning my portfolio for. Um, and unfortunately, we, we have to live through this blip. We have to go through this. Uh, next couple of months are going to be a possibly survival mode where uh, the kitchen sink and not only the kitchen sink, but the entire kitchen and the entire apartment is gonna be thrown at oil price to try and knock it down before midterms, um, midterm elections here. 
so they can claim victory. And in the meantime, supply, the supply issue just gets worse and worse and worse. And projects being canceled, rigs, American rigs are down four weeks out of the last five. Who would have said that in a, in a $90 oil price environment? It's, uh, we're in a different regime. The, the, the drill baby drill thing is completely gone. It's, it's just not there. And if it is there, well, the, there's not enough labor, parts, steel, rigs, crews, land, wells. It's just uh, not there. So um, yeah, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a fun ride. It's gonna be a hell of a ride. It's, it's been a hell of a ride so far. And it's gonna be, uh, it's just gonna be uh, a lot more fun going forward. A lot of volatility, a lot less participants in the market. Um, but you can't, you can't print barrels. You can't print gas molecules. You can't print a ton of coal. Um, so that's the thesis. That's always been the thesis. And that's going to be going forward until I see oil demand, until I see the oil supply demand become uh, different in any way, as in oil demand fall off materially or a bunch of oil supply come online. Um, the thesis is what the thesis is. I think a lot of us who are on this call are invested because of that, that thesis. And um, there's gonna be blips in the way that uh, was known. And the SPR has just created a bigger blip uh, along with the midterms and the recession risk and everything else uh, to go along with it. Um, so, uh, okay, there's a couple questions here. Um, Neil is asking, uh, a lot of private companies being bought out. Any thoughts on public ones? Um, I still think there's going to be a lot of M&A in the next three to six months, yes. Uh, the thing with the public companies is, are the share, shareholders really gonna sell? You know, if, if CNRL came out and said, we wanna buy ARC resources for 18 bucks a share, would the shareholders really sell at that price? Would MEG shareholders sell at 15 bucks a share? Would crew energy shareholders sell for six dollars a share? I don't think so, and and I think that's where companies are being gun shy about about going after public companies because if the management team is not willing to take the deal, you have to go and do a hostile takeover. At which point you need, I believe, it's sixty like sixty six percent of shareholder approval, and I don't think companies are confident that they're going to get that. Uh, uh, that's just my opinion. There are some rumors of other companies that are being bought out, uh, the Montney area, especially some of the conventional uh, slash cardium stuff has been on sale forever. Some of the Viking plays have been on sale forever, which to me tells me there's either a valuation gap or just not enough interest in old declining assets uh, that you can't, you can't produce higher oil amounts from. So uh, we'll see. Uh, can you talk about a few of the better dividend buys since Friday's pummeling? Um, I don't really look at dividends that often. It's not that interesting to me uh, to invest in these companies for dividends only. But uh, like you mentioned, Cardinal, 11% yield, is it roughly? Uh, gear energy, 10, 9 to 10 to 11 percent yield in there. So those would be some of the good ones. Um, some of your major companies, like your CNRLs and your your Synovuses are sort of, or not Synovus, CNRLs and Suncors are getting more interesting. I'm kind of a real fan of Suncor with their diesel barrels and the diesel crack being so high. I'm I'm kind of looking. I've been looking at Suncor options. Uh, for 2023, mid 23, early 24. Uh, other than that, I, I, I still like white cap here. I, I think um, they just had an insider buy by Grant there on Friday. So showing support for the company. Uh, it's one that there was news came out of the, was it the Peters conference that they drilled Duvernay, they drilled, uh, wells in the XTO acreage came on at 2000 BOEs per day, four of them. That's, that's sort of what I was expecting is, is, is production beat. I, I would not be surprised to see white caps say 
over the next six months that one of their wells in this XTO acreage came on at three, 4,000 BOEs per day. Um, the acreage is that undeveloped. It's, it's fully pressured up to its full potential. There's been no drilling. And you come in, you drill a one and a half mile lateral, you drill a two, two, two mile lateral, you could produce three, 4,000 BOEs for a couple of months from these wells. It's not out of the question. Uh, so I think that's one that I'm watching. Um, obviously the junior plays, I still like them. I'm keeping my eye out for blocks. If I can buy bigger blocks uh, of these names. And other than that, I'm, I'm pretty much set. I like my surge. I like my Meg. I like my obsidian. Uh, I like my crew. And, uh, I, I think I would be looking to add to Spartan Delta again here. Uh, if it if it lags the market, I, I do think that's a company that's doing some really good stuff in the Montney. Uh, even if they do some acquisitions, I don't really want to get into it pre-acquisition, but uh, if they do announce a deal and it drops 5% or something, I think I would be out there uh, buying. Um, I think that's that's kind of all I'm focused on right now. I'm, I'm not really looking at anything too much out there uh, outside of my sort of my core uh, competencies and the, the the companies that I like and I'm following very, very closely. Uh, Surge has been drilling some really good Frobisher uh, wells and uh, I look forward to their multi-leg uh, horizontal drills as things go on here. Uh, and Robert mentions that uh, the reason for no open interest in paper oil is because no oil companies are hedging. Uh, so there you go. The oil companies are not in there. Some of the retail people are not in there. Some of the commercial funds are not in there. Uh, some of the other traders are just not playing the markets. So it's going to be volatile. It, that's just what happens when you have less participants in the market, you have volatility. It's yeah. That's just the way things are. So I, I'm not gonna sit here and say there's gonna be less volatility. I would expect more volatility uh, going forward, especially because it's it's not just paper oil. It's, it's even just like a physical oil issue. There's way too much going on worldwide. There's the Libyan barrels, the Kazakh barrels, the Russian barrels, uh, Chinese barrels. You have SPR releasing, not just in the US, remember. There's SPR. The SPR release was a worldwide effort. Uh, there, there's oil in Japan being released, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Switzerland. Um, you got your, your floating storage that's being pulled and drawn down. So there's that. And then you have the narrative war on top of that with, with the American administration, with the OPEC administration, uh, Saudi Arabia, with Russia, with China. There's too many chefs in the kitchen and there's too many, there's too many chefs in the kitchen, and it, it's just going, going crazy. So uh, that's just how the market's going to be. Um, both ways, each bear and bull is going to have their days, but the risk to me is still skewed to the upside. Really, no matter where we go, the risk of this is just kicking the can down the road. You release 200 million SPR, well. What did you really do? You, you stopped supply from coming online when you should have told supply and, and gave supply signals to come online. You made them stop their projects. So what's coming on the other side is gonna be even worse and worse and worse the longer this continues. Uh, West Can update. I think we're on leg seven probably by now. Uh, it was one day per leg is what I had estimated. And after the legs are drilled, there'll probably be two, three, four, five days of, of tying it in and getting the rig out of the way, getting the production team on site, uh, flowing it into their, I don't know if it's a tank treating facility or it's a separator there, uh, flowing it into there. And uh, so if we're on leg seven, let's say leg seven or eight today, that gives us about a week. So next Sunday, the well should be producing its first oil. Um, and I'm thinking two weeks from today, maybe, 
we should have our first sort of update. Uh, the management team there is aware that they need to put out more updates, more timely updates, and more regular updates as to what's going on, given that the entire, basically the entire fate of this company depends on this drill. Uh, we can't have, we can't have uh, blank periods for weeks and weeks as to what's happening. Uh, so I look forward to that drill uh, and the results of that. I think if the results go good, they will be pushing for a second drill, possibly November, early November. So uh, really, really looking forward to that. That's a play that's very close to my uh, petroleum engineering heart, I guess. Uh, I've always wanted to be part of a sort of this, this wildcat. It's not really a wildcat, but a, a new drill in a new area that, that could be a gusher. You know, not not just a regular drill that we already know what's going to happen, uh, but something that could really surprise to the upside. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll know soon. I think October 9th is two Sundays from today. So maybe by the time I present that seminar, we'll have a news release to discuss uh, on that. And uh, yeah, uh, Saturn has an OTC listing now. Okay, right on. Um, that's good to know. I'll add that to my price target spreadsheet if I haven't uh, already. Uh, thanks, Al. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll end it there. Um, so, okay, so uh, dividends, there's some dividend names in here, midstream companies like SFL, SHLX and USDP. Um, I'm unaware of these names, but for, for those who are looking for dividends, uh, there you go. And uh, any comments on Vermilion? Um, I don't. I don't really have any comments on Vermilion. Nothing. Nothing has changed. There was a somebody had messaged me the other day saying, "Can you provide an update from April?" But there isn't really nothing to update. The, the company is what it is, and what I hope Vermilion is doing right now is saying, "You know what? Go go buy back the maximum shares you can every day. Whatever the maximum is, just go and buy them on the open market." And I hope that's what they're doing because that's the only real good use of their dollar right now. Um, or they're saving up cash to do a, to do a substantial issuer bid. Uh, I, I really hope they're not paying back debt right now. That, that would be the dumbest thing to do right now because they're in a unique position where other companies have seen their cash flows drop off as the price of oil has come down. Um, so, they can't really go and be active in the share buyback market, even if the share prices are lower. Vermilion is still making tons of money from their European gas. So they, they have the benefit of extra cash flow coming in and a depressed share price. And they should be using that to the maximum of their extent. And they can knock down the share, the share count substantially. Like for them to buy, call it 6% of their float is gonna cost them $260 million. So about half of their free cash flow for one quarter. Come on. Like you, you should really be, be going out and maximizing these uh these buybacks right now. Um and yeah, that's that on Vermillion. So um, yeah, thanks for the question. So the next couple of weeks, I got four junior companies on each. So October 2nd and then October 9th, I got uh, four junior names on each of them. And then October 16th will be the Q3 preview session, which I'm really looking forward to presenting. Uh, it's gonna be about two to three minutes on each company and just a, a basic broad introduction to the company. What are their catalysts? What is unique about the company? What makes them special? And what are the risks? It's gonna be two to three minutes for all 57, 58 companies, about a three hour session. And uh, it's gonna go really well going into Q3 earnings. And uh, for any new investors looking for a overall um, information on the sector and the equities, um, I, I look forward to presenting that. And then, like I said, October 30th will likely be the macro session. Um, and then I do have a water flooding EOR seminar also coming up uh, explaining how that works and examples of where it does work, where it didn't work. Uh, polymer flooding, CO2, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so look for that. And then the work is still ongoing on the Tableau uh, dashboards. So um, it's going to be another few weeks, I think, before something really tangible comes out of that. But uh, look forward to, to getting that out. And in the meantime, I've just been playing around with uh, the Vortex, especially uh, some of the crude flows, I think is very, very important to track. Uh, along with that, I have uh, this uh, crude storage as well. Um, no, sorry, where is it? I have uh, onshore crude inventories now access, um, which is really, really cool because I can track uh, kind of real time supply demand in a way, uh, along with getting really, really solid um, information on predicting EIA reports. Uh, not saying that it's accurate by any means, but you get a better understanding of where Cushing is, where the Gulf Coast is, uh, exports and imports, and then sort of get a better understanding of the of the EIA numbers as they come out. Um, I should run some samples to see whether it's actually true or not, but I, I do hope to have a really good model here in the next kind of couple of months on, on that. Um, that being said, the EI data is complete trash. So uh, it, it doesn't mean that the model is wrong. It could mean that the, what they're putting out is uh, not correct on a, on a week to week basis. Um, yeah, uh, so there's final question here on Prospera energy performance. Um, uh, I think it's just too early to be satisfied or not satisfied. It's uh, Prospera, Razor, Prairie Provident, uh, 10th Ave, names like this are like a 12 to 18 to 24 month hold. So I'm gonna give them time to really prove out what they wanna prove out. Uh, Prospera's latest update, nobody was paying attention, but their, their oil production rate is way higher than what they reported for their Q2 uh, quarterly results. So, uh, for those who are interested in that name, possibly something to keep in mind. Uh, the market is not is not paying attention. Let's be honest. The market, the market isn't even paying attention to your mid cap and large cap names, let alone doing deep dives into junior micro cap companies. Uh, but when the time comes, the time will come. Look at look at the performance of these junior names from like May fifteenth to June twelfth. When the money really started rolling in, you could not buy shares. You you could not you could not buy a share unless you were, you're willing to pay five, 10, 15 percent above market. And um, unfortunately, that that sort of phase of the cycle got derailed early. Um, but it's coming. It's coming uh, sooner than later, and money is going to flow in to where it sees opportunity. Uh, so, uh, on that note. I'll end it here. Uh, appreciate everyone joining in. Another great Sunday. Um, I think this kind of ends my valuation session portion uh, because I've covered almost every company out there. I think I think every company now has been covered, except maybe two or three that I I either can't cover due to a conflict of interests or they just don't have any reason to be covered. Um, I guess put it that way. Um, so we'll move more to the junior names, the some of the water flooding seminars, macro outlooks, uh, the dashboards part of the kind of the uh, growth of this. And um, once again, appreciate everyone joining in. Uh, always, always love the questions, the support, uh, and uh, everything else here. So uh, thanks again, and we'll catch you at the uh, next one on next Sunday.